May it please the tribunal. <clears throat> it is my responsibility and my privilege to present today the case on the individual responsibility to the defendant Hans Fritschi for crimes against the peace, war crimes, <clears throat> and crimes against humanity as they relate directly to the common plan or conspiracy. With the permission of the tribunal, it is planned to make the presentation in three principal divisions. First, a short listing of the various positions held by Defendant Fritschi in the Nazi state. Second, a discussion of Fritschi's conspiratorial activities within the propaganda ministry from 1933 through the attack on the Soviet Union. And third, a discussion of Fritsch's connection as a Nazi propagandist to the atrocities and the ruthless occupation policy which formed a part of the common plan and conspiracy. Enlisting Fritsch's position is not intended at first to describe the functions of these positions. Later on in describing some of Fritchie's conspiratorial acts, I shall take up a discussion of some of these positions which he held. Fritchie's party membership and his various positions in the propaganda apparatus of the Nazi state are shown by two affidavits by Fritchie himself. Document number 2976 PS, which is already in evidence as U.S. Exhibit 20, and document number 3469 PS, which I offer in evidence as U.S. Exhibit 721. Uh, both of these affidavits have been put into the four working languages of this tribunal. Fritschi became a member of the Nazi party on the 1st of May, 1933. And he continued to be a member until the collapse in 1945. Fritschi began his services with the staff of the Reich Ministry for People's Enlightenment and Propaganda, hereafter uh, referred to as the Propaganda Ministry, on the 1st of May, 1933. And he remained within the Propaganda Ministry until the Nazi downfall. Before the Nazis seized political power in Germany, and beginning in September, 1932, Fritschi was head of the wireless news service, Drahtloser Dienst, an agency of the Reich government, at that time under the government of the defendant von Papen. <clears throat> After the wireless news service was incorporated into the propaganda ministry of Dr. Goebbels in May 1933, Fritsche continued as its head until the year 1938. Upon entering the propaganda ministry in May 1933, Fritschi also became head of the news section of the press division of the propaganda ministry. He continued in this position until 1937. In the summer of 1938, Fritschi was appointed deputy to one Alfred Ingemar Berndt, who was then head of the German press division. The German press division in the indictment is called the home press division, since German press division seems to be a more literal translation. Uh, we have called it the German press division throughout this presentation. It is sometimes otherwise known as the domestic press division. We shall show later that this division was the major section of the press division of the Reich cabinet. 
Now, in December 1938, Fritchie succeeded Berndt as the head of the German Press Division. Between 1938 and, 1940, and November 1942, Fritchie was promoted three times. He advanced in title from Superior Government Council to Ministerial Council, then to Ministerial Dirigent, and finally to Ministerial Director. In November 1942, Fritchie was relieved of this position as head of the German Press Division by Dr. Goebbels and accepted from Dr. Goebbels a newly created position in the Propaganda Ministry, that of Plenipotentiary for the Political Organization of the Greater German Radio. At the same time, he also became head of the radio division of the Propaganda Ministry. He held both these positions in radio until the Nazi downfall. There are two allegations of the indictment concerning Fritchie's position for which we are unable to offer proof. These allegations appear at page 34 of the English translation. The first unsupported allegation states that Fritchie was, quote, editor-in-chief of the official German news agency. Deutsche Nachrichten Büro, end quote. <coughs> the second unsupported allegation states that Fritchie was, quote, head of the radio division of the propaganda department of the Nazi party, end quote. Fritchie denies having held either of these positions in his affidavit, and therefore, these two allegations must fall for want of proof. Before discussing the documentation of the case, I wish in passing to state my appreciation for the assistance of Mr. Norbert Heilpern, Mr. Alfred Booth, and Lieutenant Niebergall, who sits at my right, uh, for their assistance in research, analysis, and translation. The tribunal will note the relative shortness of this document book. It has been marked uh, as document book MM. It contains only 32 pages, which have been numbered consecutively, I believe, in red pencil for your convenience. The shortness of the documentation on this particular case is possible only because of a long affidavit made by the defendant Fritchett, which was signed by him on the 7th of January, 1946. It seems appropriate to comment on this significant document before proceeding. It is before you, your honors, as document number 3469PS, beginning at document book, page 19. As I said, it has been translated into the four working uh, languages of this proceeding. Now, this affidavit contains materials which have been extracted from interrogations of Fritchett and many materials which Fritchie volunteered to give himself upon request made by me through his defense counsel, Dr. Fritch. Some of the portions of the final affidavit were originally typed or handwritten by the defendant Fritchie himself during this trial or during the holiday recess. All these materials were finally incorporated into one single affidavit. Now, this affidavit 
contains Fritchie's account of the events which led to his entering the propaganda ministry and his account of his later connections with that ministry. Before Fritchie made some of the statements in the affidavit concerning the role of propaganda in relation to important <coughs> foreign political events, he was shown illustrative headlines, an article from the German press of that time, so that he could refresh his recollection and make more accurate statements. It is believed that the tribunal will desire to consider many portions of this affidavit, independent of this presentation, along with the proof on the conspirators' use of propaganda as a principal weapon in the conspiracy. Some of this proof, you will recall, was submitted by Major Wallace in the first days of this trial in connection with the brief E, entitled, quote, Propaganda, Censorship, and Supervision of Cultural Activities, and the corresponding document book to which I call the tribunal's attention. Now, in the Fritchie affidavit, there are a number of statements which I would say were in the nature of, of self-serving declarations. With respect to these, the prosecution requests only that the tribunal consider them in the light of the whole conspiracy and the indisputable facts which appear throughout the record. <coughs> the prosecution did not feel either as a matter of expediency or of fairness that it should request Fritchie, through his defense lawyer, Dr. Fritz, to remove some of these self-serving declarations at this time and submit them later in connection with his defense. Since I shall refer to this affidavit at numerous times throughout the presentation, perhaps the members of the tribunal will wish to place a special marker in their document books. By referring to paragraphs four and five of the affidavit, the tribunal will note that Fritchie first became a successful journalist in the service of the Hugenberg Press, the most important chain of newspaper enterprises in pre-Nazi Germany. The Hugenberg concern owned papers of its own, but, but primarily, it was important because it served newspapers which principally supported the so-called national parties of the right, including the NSDAP. In paragraph five of his affidavit, Fritchie relates that in September 1932, when the defendant von Papen was Reich Chancellor, he was made head of the wireless news service, replacing someone who was politically unbearable to the Papen regime. The wireless news service, I might say, was a government agency for spreading news by radio. Fritcher began making radio broadcasts about this time with very great success success which Goebbels recognized and was later to exploit very efficiently on behalf of these Nazi conspirators. Now the Nazis seized power on the 30th of January, 1933. From paragraph 10 of the Fritchie affidavit, we find that that very evening, 30th of January, 1933. Two emissaries from Goebbels visited Fritchie. One of them was Dressler Andres, head of the radio division of the NSDAP. The other, an assistant of Dressler Andres, named Sadilla Manton. These two emissaries notified Fritchie that although Goebbels was angry with Fritchie, for writing a critical article concerning Hitler. Still, Goebbels recognized Fritch's public success on the radio since the previous fall. 
They stated further that Goebbels desired to retain Fritsche as head of the wireless news service on certain conditions. One, that Fritsche discharge all Jews. Two, that he discharge all other personnel who would not join the NSDAP. Three, that he employ with the wireless news service the second Goebbels emissary, Sedilla Manson. Fritchie refused all these conditions except the hiring of Sedilla Manson. This was one of the first ostensible compromises after the seizure of power, which Fritchie made on his road to the Nazi camp. Fritcher continued to make radio broadcasts during this period in which he supported the National, National Socialist Coalition government, then still existing. In early 1933, SR troops several times called at the wireless service and Fritchie prevented them with some difficulty from making news broadcasts. In April 1933, Goebbels called the young Fritchie to him for a personal audience. Paragraph 9 of his affidavit, document number 3469, Fritchie has volunteered the following concerning his prior relationship with Dr. Goebbels. Quote, I was acquainted with Dr. Goebbels since 1928. Apparently, he had taken a liking to me, besides the fact that in my press activities, I had always treated the National Socialists in a friendly way until 1931. Already before 1933, Goebbels, who was the editor of the attack, Der Angriff, a Nazi newspaper, had frequently made flattering remarks about the form and content of my work, which I, had, which I did as contributor of many, quote, national, unquote, newspapers and periodicals, among which were also reactionary papers and periodicals, end quote. At the first goebbels fritsche discussion in early April 1933, Goebbels informed Fritchie of his decision to place the wireless news service within the propaganda ministry as of 1 May 1933. He suggested that Fritchie make certain rearrangements in the personnel which would remove Jews and other persons who did not support the NSDAP. Fritchie debated with Goebbels concerning some of these steps. It must be said that during this period, Fritsche made some efforts to place Jews in other jobs. In a second conference with Goebbels shortly thereafter, Fritsche informed Goebbels about the steps he had taken in reorganizing the wireless news service. Goebbels thereupon informed Fritsche that he would like to have him reorganize and modernize the entire news services of Germany within the controls of the propaganda ministry. It will be recalled by the tribunal that on the 17th of March, 1933, approximately two months before this time, the propaganda ministry had been formed by decree 1933, Reichsgazetteblatt, Part 1, page 104, our document number 2029 PS. Now, Fritchie was intrigued by the Goebbels offer. He proceeded to conclude the Goebbels inspired reorganization of the wi wireless news service, and on the 1st of May 1933, 
together with the remaining members of his staff, he joined the propaganda ministry. On this same day, he joined the NSJAP and took the customary oath of unconditional loyalty to the fear. From this time on, whatever reservations Fritchie may have had, either then or later, to the cause, to the course of events under the Nazis, Fritchie was completely within the Nazi camp. For the next 13 years, he assisted in creating and in using the principal propaganda devices which the conspirators employed with such telling effect in each of the principal phases of this conspiracy. From 1933 until 1942, Fritsche held one or more positions within the German press division. For four years, indeed, he headed this division. During those crucial years, 1938 to 1942. That covers the period when the Nazis undertook actual military invasion of neighboring countries. It is therefore believed appropriate to spell out in some detail before this tribunal the functions of this German press division. These functions will show the important and indeed unique position of the German press division as an instrument of the Nazi conspirators, not only in dominating the mind and the psychology of Germans through the German press division and through the radio, but also as an instrument of foreign policy and psychological warfare against other nations. The already broad jurisdiction of the propaganda ministry was extended by a Hitler decree of the 30th of June, 1933. Found in 1933, Reich Gazette Part 1, page 449. From that decree, I wish to quote only one sentence. It is found in document number 2030 PS, your document books at page 3. Quote The Reich Minister of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda has jurisdiction over the whole field of spiritual indoctrination of the nation, of propagandizing the state, of cultural and economic propaganda, of enlightenment of the public at home and abroad. Furthermore, he is in charge of the administration of all institutions serving those purposes, unquote. It is important to underline the stated propaganda objective of, quote, enlightenment at home and abroad, end quote. For a clear exposition of the general functions of the German press division of the propaganda ministry, the tribunal is referred to document number 2434 PS, document book page 5, which is offered in evidence as USA Exhibit 722. This document is an appropriate excerpt from a book by George Wilhelm Mueller, a ministerial director in the propaganda ministry of which the tribunal is asked to take judicial notice. Fritch's affidavit, paragraphs 14, 15, and 16, beginning at page 22 of your document book, contains an exposition of the functions of the German press division, a description which confirms and adds to the exposition in Mueller's book. Concerning the German press division, 
Fritch's affidavit states. Quote, during the whole period, from 1933 to 1945, it was the task of the German press division to supervise the entire domestic press and to provide it with directives by which this division became an efficient instrument in the hands of German state leadership. More than 2,300 German daily newspapers were subjected to this control. The aim of this supervision and control in the first years following 1933 was to change basically the conditions existing in the press before the seizure of power. That meant the coordination into the new order of those newspapers and periodicals which were in the service of capitalistic special interests or party politics. While the administrative functions, wherever possible, were exercised by the professional associations and the Reich press chamber, <coughs> the political leadership of the German press was entrusted to the German press division. The head of the German press division held daily co press conferences in the ministry for the representatives of all German newspapers. Hereby, all instructions were given to the representatives of the press. These instructions were transmitted daily, almost without exception, and mostly by telephone, from headquarters by Dr. Otto Dietrich, Reich Press Chief, in a fixed statement, the so-called daily parole of the Reich Press Chief. Before the statement was fixed, the head of the German press division submitted to him, Dietrich, the current press wishes expressed by Dr. Goebbels and by other ministries. This is the case especially with the wishes of the Foreign Office, about which Dr. Dietrich always wanted to make decisions personally or through his representatives at headquarters, Helmut Sundermann and Chief Editor Lorenz. The practical use of the general directions in detail was thus left entirely to the individual work of the individual editor. Therefore, it is by no means true that the newspapers and periodicals were a monopoly of the German press division or that essays and leading articles through it had to be submitted to the ministry. Even in the case of war, this happened in exceptional cases only. The less important newspapers and periodicals were not represented at the daily press conferences Sorry. The less important newspapers and periodicals, which were not represented at the daily press conference, received their information in a different way, by providing them either with ready-made articles and reports, or with a confidential printed instruction. The publications of all other official agencies were directed and coordinated likewise by the German press division. To enable the periodicals to get acquainted with the daily political problems of newspapers and to discuss these problems in greater detail, the information correspondence was issued especially for periodicals. Later on, it was taken over by the periodical press division. The German press division, likewise, was in charge of pictorial reporting, insofar as it directed the employment of pictorial reporters at important events. In this way, 
and conditioned by the current political situation. The entire German press was made a permanent instrument of the propaganda ministry by the German press division. Thereby, the entire German press was subordinated to the political aims of the government. This was exemplified by the timely measuring and the emphatic presentation of such press polemics as appeared to be most useful, as shown, for instance, in the following themes. The class struggle of the system era, the leadership principle and the authority politics of the system era, the Jewish problem, the conspiracy of world Jewry, the Bolshevistic danger, the plutocratic democracy abroad, the race problem generally, the church, the economic misery abroad, the foreign policy, and living space, Lebensraum, end quote. This description of Fritsche establishes clearly, and in his own words indeed, that the German press division was the instrument for subordinating the entire German press to the political aims of the government. We now pass to Fritsche's first activities on behalf of the conspirators within the German press division. It is appropriate to read again from his affidavit, paragraph 17, your document book, page 23. Fritchie begins by describing a conference with Goebbels in late April or early May of 1933. Quote, at this time, Dr. Goebbels suggested to me as a specialist on news technique, the establishment and direction of a section, quote, news, end quote, within the press division of his ministry in order to organize fully and to modernize the German news agencies. In executing this assignment given to me by Dr. Goebbels, I took for my field the entire news field for the German press and the radio in accordance with the, direction, the directions given by the propaganda ministry. At first, with the exception of the DNB, German News Agency, end quote. An obvious reason why the DNB was accepted from Fitchie's field at this time is because the DNB did not come into existence until the year 1934, as we shall later see. Later on, in paragraph 17 of the Fritchie Affidavit, the tribunal will note that tremendous funds put at the disposal of Fritchie in building up the Nazi news services. Altogether, the German news agencies received a tenfold increase in their budget from the Reich. An increase from 400,000 to 4 million marks. Fritcher himself selected and employed the chief editor for the Trans Ocean News Agency and also the Europa Press. Fritcher states that some of the, quote, directions of the propaganda ministry, which I had to follow were, and then skipping, increase of German news copy abroad at any cost, and then skipping again, spreading of favorable news on the internal construction and peaceful intentions of the national socialist system. End quote. 
End quote. End quote. End quote. End quote. About the summer of 1934, the defendant Funk, then Reich press chief, achieved the fusion of the two most important domestic news agencies, the Wolf Telegraph Agency and the Telegraph Union, and thus formed the official German news agency, ordinarily known as the DNB. It has already been pointed out to the tribunal that the indictment is in error in alleging that Fritzsche himself was editor-in-chief of the DNB. Fritzsche held no position whatsoever with the DNB at any time. However, as head of the news section of the German press division, Fritch's duties gave him official jurisdiction over the DNB, which was, after 1934, the official domestic news agency of the German Reich. In the last paragraph of, in the last part of paragraph 17 of this affidavit, Fritch states that he coordinated the work of the various foreign news agencies, quote, within the inland Europe and overseas foreign countries with each other and in relationship to DNB, end quote. The wireless news service was headed by Fritzsche from 1932 to 1937. After January 1933, the wireless news service was the official instrument of the Nazi government in spreading news over the radio. During the same time that Fritzsche headed the wireless news service, he personally made radio broadcasts to the German people. These broadcasts were naturally subject to the controls of the propaganda ministry and reflected its purposes. The influence of Fritzsche's broadcasts upon the German people during this period of consolidation of control by the Nazi conspirators is all the more important since Fritzsche was currently head of the wireless news service which controlled for the government the spreading of all news by radio. It is well known to the world by now that the Nazi conspirators attempted to be, and often were, very adept in psychological warfare. Before each major aggression, with some few exceptions based on the strategy of expediency, they initiated a press campaign calculated to weaken their victims and to prepare the German people psychologically for the impending Nazi madness. They used the press after the earlier conquests as a means for further influencing foreign politics and in maneuvering for the next following aggression. By the time of the occupation of the Sudetenland on 1 October 1938, Fritzsche had become deputy head of the entire German press division. Fritzsche states that the role of German propaganda before the Munich Agreement on the Sudetenland was directed by his immediate chief, Bernd, then head of the German press division. In paragraph 27 of the Fritzsche affidavit, page 26 of your document book, Fritzsche describes this propaganda, which was directed by Berndt. Speaking of Berndt, Fritsch states, quote, he exaggerated minor events very strongly, 
Use sometimes old episodes as new. And there even came complaints from the Sudetenland itself that much of the news reported by the German press was untrustworthy. As a matter of fact, after the great foreign political success at Munich in September 1938, there came a noticeable crisis in the confidence of the German people in the trustworthiness of its press. This was one reason for the recalling of Berndt in December 1938, after the conclusion of the Sudeten action, and for my appointment as head of the German press division. Beyond this, Berndt, by his admittedly successful but still primitive military-like orders to the German press, had lost the confidence of the German editors. Now what happened, end quote. Now what happened at this time? Fritchie was made head of the German press division in place of Baron. Between December 1938 and 1942, Fritzsche, as head of the German press division, personally gave to the representatives of the principal German newspapers the, quote, daily parole of the Reich press chief, end quote. During this history-making period, he was the principal conspirator directly concerned with the manipulations of the press. The first important foreign aggression after Fritzsche became head of the German press division was the incorporation of Bohemia and Moravia. In paragraph 28 of his affidavit, your document books, page eight, Fritzsche gives his account of the propaganda action surrounding the incorporation of Bohemia and Moravia as follows. That's paragraph 28, document book, page 26. <coughs> Quote. The action for the incorporation of Bohemia and Moravia, which took place on 15 March 1939, <coughs> while I was head of the German press division, was not prepared for such a long time as the Sudeten action. According to my memory, it was in February that I received the order from the Reich press chief, Dr. Dietrich, which was repeated as a request by the envoy Paul Schmidt of the Foreign Office to bring the attention of the press to the efforts for the independence of Slovakia and to the continued anti-German coalition politics of the Prague government. I did this. The daily paroles of the Reich press chief and the press conference minutes at that time show the wording of the propaganda instructions. Uh, correction there. Of the corresponding instructions. These were the typical headlines of leading newspapers and the emphatic leading articles of the German daily press at that time. One, the terrorizing of Germans within the Czech territories by arrest, shooting of Germans by the state police, destruction and damaging of German homes by Czech gangsters. Two, the concentration of Czech forces on the Sudeten frontier. Three, the kidnapping, deporting, and persecuting of Slovakian minorities by the Czechs that the Czechs must get out of Slovakia. Four, 
secret meetings of red functionaries in Prague. Some few days before the visit of Hasha, I received the instruction to publish in the press very emphatically the incoming news on the unrest in Czechoslovakia. Such information I received only partly from the German news agency, DNB. Mostly it came from the press division of the Foreign Office, and some of it came from big newspapers with their own news services. The Folkische Beobachter, which, as I learned later on, received its information from the SS Standartenführer Gunter Dahlquen. He was at this time in Pressburg. I had forbidden all news agencies and newspapers to issue news on unrest in Czechoslovakia until I had seen it. I wanted to avoid a repetition of the very annoying result of the Sudeten action propaganda. And I did not want to suffer a loss of prestige caused by untrue news. Thus, all news checked by me was admittedly full of tendency, however not invented. After the visit of Hacha in Berlin, and after the beginning of the invasion of the German army, which took place on 15 March 1939, the German press had enough material for describing those events. Historically and politically, the event was justified with the indication that the Declaration of, in of Independence of Slovakia had required an interference, and that Pasha, with his signature, had avoided a war and had reinstated a thousand-year union between Bohemia and the Reich." End quote. The propaganda campaign of the press preceding the invasion of Poland on the 1st of September 1939, and thus the propaganda action just preceding the precipitation of World War II, bears again the handiwork of Fritzsche and his German press division. In paragraph 30 of Fritzsche's affidavit, document book, page 27, Fritzsche speaks of the conspirators' treatment of this episode as follows. Very complicated, this is a quote, very complicated and changing was the press and propagandistic treatment in the case of Poland. Under the influence of the German-Polish agreement, it was generally forbidden in the German press for many years to publish anything on the situation of the German minority in Poland. This remained also the case when in the spring of 1939, the German press was asked to become somewhat more active as to the problem of Danzig. Also, when the first Polish-English conversations took place, and when the German press was instructed to use a sharper tone against Poland, the question of the German minority still remained in the background. But during the summer, this problem was picked up again and created immediately a noticeable sharpening of the situation. Namely, each larger German newspaper had for some time quite an abundance of material on complaints of the Germans in Poland, without the other editors having had a chance to use this material. The German papers from the time 
of the minority discussion at Geneva still had correspondence for free collaborators in Katowice, Bromberg, Posen, Thorne, etc. Their material now came forth with a bound. Concerning this, the leading German newspapers, upon the basis of direction given out in the so-called daily parole, brought out the following publicity with great emphasis. One, cruelty and terror against Germans and the extermination of Germans in Poland. Two, forced labor of thousands of German men and women in Poland. Three, Poland, land of servitude and disorder. The desertion of Polish soldiers. The increased inflation in Poland. Four, provocation of frontier clashes upon direction of the Polish government. The Polish lust to conquer. Five, persecution of Czechs and Ukrainians by Poland. The Polish press replied particularly sharply. End quote. The press campaign preceding the invasion of Yugoslavia followed the conventional pattern. You will find the customary defamation, the lies, the incitement, and the threat, and the usual attempt to divide and to weaken the victim. Paragraph 32 of the Fritchier Affidavit your document book, page 28, outlines this propaganda action as follows. Quote, during the period immediately preceding the invasion of Yugoslavia, <coughs> on the 6th of April, 1941, the German press emphasized by headlines and leading articles the following topics. One, the planned persecution of Germans in Yugoslavia, including the burning down of German villages by Serbian soldiers. Also the confining of Germans in concentration camps. And also the physical mishandling of German speaking persons. Two, the arming of Serbian bandits by the Serbian government. Three, the incitement of Yugoslavia by the plutocrats against Germany. Four, the increasing anti-Serbian feelings in Croatia. Five, the chaotic economic and social conditions in Yugoslavia. Since Germany had a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, and because these conspirators wanted the advantage of surprise, there was no special propaganda action immediately preceding the attack on the USSR. Fritzscher, in paragraph 33 of his affidavit, discusses the propaganda line, however, for the justification of this war this aggressive war to the German people. Quote, During the night from the 21st to the 22nd of June, 1941, Ribbentrop called me in for a conference in the Foreign Office building at about five o'clock in the morning, at which representatives of the domestic and foreign press were present. Ribbentrop informed us that the war against the Soviet Union would start that same day and asked the German press to present the war against the Soviet Union as a preventative war 
for the defense of the fatherland. As a war which was forced upon us through the immediate danger of an attack of the Soviet Union against Germany. The claim that this was a preventative war was later on repeated by the newspapers which received their instructions from me during the usual daily parole of the Reich press chief. I myself have also given this presentation of the cause of the war in my regular broadcast, end quote. <coughs> Fritcher, throughout his affidavit, constantly refers to his technical and expert assistance to the colossal apparatus of the propaganda ministry. In 1939, he apparently became dissatisfied with the efficiency of the existing facilities of the German press division in furnishing grist for the propaganda mill and for its intrigues. He established a new instrument for improving the effectiveness of Nazi propaganda. In paragraph 19 of his affidavit, page 24 of your document book, Fritsche describes this new propaganda instrument as follows. Quote, about the summer of 1939, I established within the German press division a section called, quote, speed service, end quote. And then skipping and quoting again. At the start, it had the task of checking the correctness of news from foreign countries. Later on, about the fall of 1939, this section also elaborated on collecting materials which were put at the disposal of the entire German press. For instance, dates from the British colonial policy, from political statements of the British Prime Minister in former times, descriptions of social distress in hostile countries, etc. Almost all German newspapers use such material as a basis for their polemics. Hereby was achieved a great unification within the fighting front of the German press. The title Speed Service was chosen because materials for current comments were supplied with unusual speed." End quote. Throughout the entire period preceding and including the launching of aggressive war. Fritcher made regular radio broadcasts to the German people under the following program titles. Political newspaper review, political and radio show, and later Hans Fritcher speaks. His broadcasts naturally reflected the polemics and the controls of his ministry and thus of the common plan or conspiracy. We of the prosecution contend that Fritsche, one of the most eminent of the Goebbels' propaganda team, helped substantially to bathe the world in the bloodbath of aggressive war. With the tribunal's consent, I will now pass on to proof bearing on Fritchie's incitement of atrocities and his encouragement of a ruthless occupation policy. The results of propaganda as a weapon of the Nazi conspirators reaches into every aspect of this conspiracy, including the abnormal and inhuman conduct involved in the atrocities and the ruthless exploitation of the occupied countries.
most of the ordinary members of the German nation would never have participated in or tolerated the atrocity committed throughout Europe if they had not been conditioned and goaded to barbarous convictions and misconceptions by the constant grinding of the Nazi propaganda machine. Indeed, the propagandists who lent themselves to this evil mission of instigation and incitement are more guilty than the credulous and callous minions who headed the firing squads or operated the gas chambers of which we have heard so much in this proceeding. For the very credulity and the callousness of those minions was in large part due to the constant and evil propaganda of Fritzsche and his official associates. Now with respect to Jews, the propaganda department within the propaganda ministry had a special branch for the, quote, enlightenment of the German people and of the world as to the Jewish question. Fighting with propagandistic weapons against enemies of the state and hostile ideologies." End quote. This quotation is taken from a book written in 1940 by Ministerial Director Mueller entitled, quote, The Propaganda Ministry, end quote. It is found in document number 2434 PS, your document book, page 10, offered in evidence as U.S. Seven twenty-two. Uh, mention that document, uh, Your Honors. I should have said document number twenty-four thirty-four, paren a n paren c i. It's another excerpt from Ministerial Director Mueller's book, and I merely ask that you take judicial notice of it for that one sentence that I have read. Fritcher took a particularly active part in this enlightenment concerning the Jewish question in his radio broadcast. These broadcasts literally teemed with provocative libels against the Jews. The only ro logical result of which was to inflame Germany to further atrocities against the helpless Jews who came within its physical power. Document number 3064 PS contains a number of complete broadcasts by Fritchie, which were monitored by the British Broadcasting Corporation and translated by BBC officials. For the convenience of the tribunal, I have had those excerpts upon which the prosecution relies here to show illustrative types of Fritch's broadcast, mimeographed and made into one document, which I offer in evidence as USA Exhibit 723. Even the defendant Stryker, the master Jew baiter of all time, could scarcely outdo Fritchie in some of his slanders against the Jews. All the excerpts in document 3064 PS are from speeches of Fritchie given on the radio between 1941 and 1945, which we have already proven was a period of intensified anti-Jewish measures. With the permission of the tribunal, I would like to read some of these excerpts. Page 14 of your document, folks. Item one. From a broadcast of the 18th of December, 1941, which is found at page 2122 of the uh, translations from the BBC. Quote. 
the fate of Jewry in Europe has turned out as unpleasant as the fear predicted in the case of a European war. After the extension of the war, instigated by the Jews, this unpleasant fate may also spread to the new world. For you can hardly assume that the nations of this new world will pardon the Jews for the misery of which the nations of the old world did not absolve them. From a broadcast of the 18th of March, 1941, found at page 2032 of the BBC translations. Quote, five. But the crown of all wrongly applied Rooseveltian logics is the sentence, quote, there never was a race and there never will be a race which can serve the rest of mankind as a master, unquote. Quoting Fritchie again, here too we can only applaud Mr. Roosevelt. Precisely because there exists no race which can be the master of the rest of mankind, we Germans have taken the liberty to break the domination of Jewry and of its capital in Germany, of Jewry which believed to have inherited the crown of secret world domination." End quote. In passing, I would merely like to note that it seems to us that that is not only applause for past acts concerning persecution of Jews, but an announcement that more was coming and an encouragement of what was coming. I would like to read another excerpt from the 9th of October, 1941, a broadcast translated at page 2101 of the BBC translation. Quote, <clears throat> We know very well that these German victories unparalleled in history, have not yet stopped the source of hatred which, for a long time, has fed the warmongers and from which this war originated. The international Jewish democratic Bolshevistic campaign of incitement against Germany still find cover in this or that fox's lair or rat hole. We have seen only too frequently how the defeat suffered by the warmongers only doubled their senseless and impotent fury. Another broadcast, the 8th of January, 1944. Your Honors, I've tried to pick out an illustrative broadcast from different periods here. Quote, it is revealed clearly once more that not a system of government, not a young nationalism, not a new and well-applied socialism brought about this war. The guilty ones are exclusively the Jews and the plutocrats. If discussion on the post-war problems bring this to light so clearly, we welcome it as a contribution for later discussion and also as a fight to the contribution we are waging now. For we refuse to believe that world history will confide its future developments to these powers which have brought about this war. This clique of Jews and plutocrats have invested their money in armaments and they had to see to it that they would get their interest and sinking funds Hence, they unleashed this war. <clears throat> Concerning Jews, I had one last quotation from the year 1945. It's from a broadcast of the 13th of January, 1945, 
found at pages 2258 and 2259 of the BBC translations. Quote, if Jewry provided a link between divergent elements as plutocracy and liberalism, and if Jewry was first able to work successfully in democratic countries in preparing this war against Germany, it has by now placed itself unreservedly on the side of Bolshevism, which, with its entirely mistaken slogans of racial freedom against racial hatred, has created the very conditions the Jewish race requires for its struggle for domination over other races. <clears throat> and then skipping a few lines in that quotation. Not the last result of German resistance on the front, so unexpected to the enemy, is the fruition of a development which began in the pre-war years. <coughs> the process of subordinating British policy to far-reaching Jewish points of view. It began long before this, when Jewish emigrants from Germany started their warmongering against us from British and American soil. And then skipping several sentences and going to the last sentence on that page. This whole attempt, <coughs> aiming at the establishment of Jewish world domination, now increasingly recognizable, has come to a head at the very moment when the people's understanding of their racial origins has been far too much awakened to promise success to the undertaking." End quote. Your Honors, we suggest that that is an invitation to further persecution of the Jews and indeed to their elimination. Fritsche also incited and encouraged ruthless measures against the people of the USSR. In his regular broadcast, Fritsche's incitements against the people's of the USSR were often linked to, and were certainly as flammatory as, his statements and slanders against the Jews. If these slanders were not so tragic in relation to the murder of millions of people, they would be comical, indeed ludicrous. It is ironic indeed that the propaganda libels against the peoples of the USSR concerning atrocities accurately describe instead some of the many atrocities committed by the German invaders, as we now well know. The following quotations are again taken from the BBC intercepted broadcasts and their translations. <coughs> They begin shortly after the invasion of the USSR in June 1941. The first one is taken from page 16 of your document books. Now I'll read only the last half of item 7, beginning with the third paragraph. <coughs> The evidence of letters, quotation, the evidence of letters reaching us from the front of PK reporters. And may I interrupt my quotation there to say that PK stands for Propaganda Company. Propaganda companies which were attached to the German army wherever it went. Of PK reporters and soldiers on leave demonstrates that in this struggle in the East, 
Not one political system is pitted against another. Not one view of life is fighting another. But that culture, civilization, and human decency make a stand against the diabolical principle of a subhuman world. End quote. And then another quote in the next paragraph. <clears throat> quote, it was only the fear's decision to strike in time that saved our homeland from the fate of being overrun by those subhuman creatures and our men, women, and children from the unspeakable horror of being their prey, end quote. In the next broadcast of the, I want to quote from, the 10th of July, 1941, the first paragraph, Fritchie speaks of the inhuman deeds committed in areas controlled by the Soviet Union. And he states that one, upon seeing the evidence of those deeds, comes, and here I quote, comes finally to make the holy resolve to give his aid in the final destruction of those who are capable of such dastardly acts, end quote. And then quoting again, the last paragraph, quote, the Bolshevik agitators make no effort to deny that in towns, thousands, and in villages, hundreds, of corpses of men, women, and children have been found who had been either killed or tortured to death. Yet the Bolshevik agitators allege that this was not done by Soviet commissars, but by German soldiers. Now we Germans know our soldiers. No German woman, father or mother, requires proof that their husband or their son cannot have committed such atrocious acts, end quote. Now evidence already in the record or shortly to be offered in this case by our Soviet colleagues will prove that zealous representatives of these Nazi conspirators did not hesitate to exterminate Soviet soldiers and civilians by scientific mass methods. These inciting remarks by Fritchie make him an accomplice in these crimes because his labeling of Soviet peoples as members of a, quote, subhuman world, end quote, seeking to, quote, exterminate, end quote, the German people and similar desperate talk these propaganda diatribes help fashion the psychological atmosphere of utter and complete unreason. And the hatred which instigated and made possible these atrocities in the East. Although we cannot say that Fritchie directed that 10,000 or 100,000 persons be exterminated it is enough to pose this question. Without these incitements of Fritchie, how much harder it would have been for these conspirators to have effected the conditions which made possible the extermination of millions of people in the East. Would that be a convenient time to break off?
Scripture encouraged and affirmed and glorified the policy of the Nazi conspirators in ruthlessly exploiting occupied countries. Again, want to read one excerpt from his radio broadcast. Item nine, taken from a broadcast of the 9th of October, 1941. It's found at pages 2102 and 2103 of the BBC translations. I would like to cut it down, but it's one of those long German sentences that just cannot be broken down. Quote, today we can only say Blitzkrieg or no, this German thunderstorm has cleansed the atmosphere of Europe. It is quite true that the dangers threatening us were eliminated one after the other with lightning speed. But in these lightning blows, which shattered England's allies on the continent, we saw not a proof of weakness, but a proof of the strength and superiority of the Fuhrer's gift as a statesman and military leader, a proof of the German people's force. We saw the proof that no opponent can stand up to the courage, discipline, and readiness for sacrifice displayed by the German soldier. And we are particularly grateful for these lightning unmatched victories because, as the Fuhrer emphasized last Friday, they give us the possibility of embarking on the organization of Europe and of the lifting of the treasures. I would like to repeat that. The lifting of the treasures of this old continent already now in the middle of war, without it being necessary for millions and millions of German soldiers to be on guard, fighting day and night along this or that threatened frontier, and the possibilities of this continent are so rich that they suffer for any need of peace or war." End quote. Concerning the, the exploitation of foreign countries, Fritchie states himself at pa paragraph 39 of his affidavit. Quote, the utilization of the productive capacity of the occupied countries for the strengthening of the war potential, I have openly and gloriously praised, chiefly because the competent authorities put at my disposal much material, especially on the voluntary placement of manpower." End quote. Now, Fritzsche was a credulous propagandist indeed. If he gloriously praised the exploitation policy of the German Reich, chiefly or especially because the competent authorities gave him a sales talk on the voluntary placement of manpower. come now to Fritzsche as the high commander of the entire German radio system. Fritzsche continued as head of the German press division until after the conspirators had begun the last of their aggressions. In November 1942, Goebbels created a new position, that of plenipotentiary for the political organization of the greater German radio, a position which Fritzsche was the first 
and the last to hold. In paragraph 35, document number 3469, the Fritzsche affidavit, Fritzsche narrates how the entire German radio and television system was organized under his supervision. That's at page 29 of your document book. He states, quote, my office practically represented the high command of German radio. And where is that? Uh, that is in paragraph 35. Unfortunately, my copy wasn't marked, Your Honor. Page 36, the last line of paragraph 36. Oh, I'm told it's the last line of uh, paragraph 36. My office practically represented the high command. I'm very grateful to you. I'm, there's a typographical error here. Paragraph 36, the last line. A special plenipotentiary for the political organization of the greater German radio, Fritzsche issued orders to all the Reich propaganda offices by teletype. <clears throat> These were used, of course, in, in conforming the entire radio apparatus of Germany to the desires of the conspirators in this field. Goebbels customarily held an 11 o'clock conference with his closest collaborators within the propaganda ministry. When both Goebbels and his undersecretary, Dr. Naumann, were absent, Goebbels, after 1943, entrusted Fritzsche with the holding of this 11 o'clock press conference. In document number 3255 PS, the court will find Goebbels' praise of Fritsch's broadcast. This praise was given in Goebbels' introduction to a book by Fritsch called, quote, War to the Warmongers, end quote. Uh, I'd like to offer the quotation evidence as USA Exhibit 724. It's from the Rundfunk Archive. Found at page 18 of your Honor's document books. This is Goebbels speaking. Quote, Nobody knows better than I how much work is involved in these broadcasts. How many times they were dictated within the last minutes to find some minutes later a willing ear by the whole nation, end quote. So we have it from Goebbels that the entire German nation was prepared to lend willing ears to Fritzsche after he had made his reputation on the radio. Paragraph. The rumor passed that Fritzsche was, quote, his master's voice, end quote. Die Stimme seines Herrn. This is certainly borne out by Fritzsche's functions. 
when Fritchie spoke on the radio, it was indeed plain to the German people that they were listening to the high command of the conspirators in this field. Now, Fritchie is not being presented by the prosecution as the type of conspirator who signed decrees or as the type of conspirator who sat in the inner councils planning all of the overall grand strategy. The function of propaganda is for the most part apart from the field of such master planning. The function of a propaganda agency is somewhat more analogous to an advertising agency or a public relations department, the job of which is to sell the product and to win the market for the enterprise in question. Here, the enterprise we submit was a Nazi conspiracy. You know, a conspiracy to commit fraud. The gifted salesman of the conspiratorial group is quite as essential and quite as culpable as the master planners, even though he may not have contributed substantially to the formulation of all the basic strategy, but rather contributed to the artful execution of the whole strategy. In this case, the prosecution does more than emphatically contend for the proposition that propaganda was a weapon of tremendous importance to this conspiracy. We further contend that the leading propagandists were major accomplices in this conspiracy, and further, that Fritchie was a major propagandist. When Fritchie entered the propaganda ministry, the most fabulous lie factory of all time, and thus attached himself to this conspiracy. He did this with a more open mind than most of these conspirators who had committed themselves at an earlier date, before the seizure of power. He was in a particularly strategic position to observe the fraud committed upon the German people and upon the world by these conspirators. The tribunal will recall that in 1933, before Fritchie took his party oath of unconditional obedience and subservience to the fear, and thus abdicated his moral responsibility to these conspirators, he had observed at first hand the operations of the stormtroopers and the Nazi race pattern in action. When, notwithstanding this, Fritchie undertook to bring the German news agencies in their entirety within fascist control, he learned from the inside, indeed from Goebbels' own lips, much of the cynical intrigue and many of the bold lies against opposition groups within and without Germany. He observed, for example, the opposition journalists profession to which he previously had been attached, being forced out of existence, crushed to the ground, either absorbed or eliminated. He continued to support the conspiracy. He learned from day to day the art of intrigue and quackery in the process of perverting the German nation. And he grew in prestige and in influence as he practiced his art. The tribunal will also recall that Fritchie has said that his predecessor, Bernd, fell from leadership of the German press division partly because he overplayed his hand by the successful but blunt and overdone manipulation of the Sudetenland propaganda. Fritchie stepped into the gap which had been caused by the loss of confidence of both the German editors and the German people. And Fritcher did his job well. No doubt Fritcher was not as blunt as the man he succeeded. But Fritcher's relative shrewdness and subtlety, his very ability to be more assuring, and to find, as Goebbels said, willing ears by the whole nation, 
These things made him the more useful accomplice of these conspirators. Nazi Germany and its press went into the actual phase of war operations with Fritzsche at the head of the particular propaganda instrument controlling the German press and German news, whether by the press or by radio. In 1942, when Fritzsche transferred from the field of the press to the field of radio, he was not removed for bungling, but only because Goebbels needed him then most in the field of radio. Fritzsche is not in the dock as a free journalist, but as an efficient, controlled Nazi propagandist. A propagandist who helped substantially to tighten the Nazi stranglehold over the German people. A propagandist who made the excesses of these conspirators more palatable to the conscience of the German people themselves. A propagandist who cynically proclaimed the barbarous racism which is at the very heart of this conspiracy. A propagandist who coldly goaded humble Germans to blind fury against people they were told by him were subhuman and guilty of all the suffering of Germany, suffering which indeed these Nazis themselves had invited. Conclusion, I wish only to say this. Without the pop propaganda apparatus of the Nazi state, it is clear that the world, including Germany, would not have suffered the catastrophe of these years. And it is because of Fritsch's able role on behalf of the Nazi conspirators and their deceitful and barbarous practices in connection with the conspiracy that he is called to account before this international tribunal.